Greetings and welcome to the Print Purana. Today's topic is the legal system of ancient India. Every complex society has felt the need to create legal systems to adjudicate disputes between individuals and groups and to determine whether people are guilty of the crime they are accused of. Such explicit and transparent systems are required if people are to have confidence in the outcome of verdicts. So it has become a dictum that justice must not only be done, but also be seen to be done. Ancient India was no exception. I was part of an editorial team that produced the Cambridge History of Ancient Law which was just published in England. As I was writing the chapter on legal procedure, it became obvious that ancient India produced some of the richest literature on this topic, vastly more copious and sophisticated than that of any other ancient civilization. In the process, the Indian jurists created a well-developed technical vocabulary. The first detailed account of legal procedure, known in Sanskrit as Vyavahara, is found in Kautilya's Arthashastra. However, it does not directly designate a person or institution in whom judicial power and functions of a society are vested. It simply describes the structure of civil and criminal courts and the procedures they are supposed to follow. Civil courts are headed by a bench of three senior officers of the state. Kautilya says, justices, called dharmasta, of ministerial rank or amatya, should conduct trials of lawsuits. In the parallel criminal justice system, courts are overseen by three different sets of officers called Prajestri. Manava Dharma Shastra or the laws of Manu, written a century or so after Kautilya, on the other hand, explicitly vests judicial authority on the king himself. It is only in his absence that a substitute judge called Prad Vivaka presides over the court. The king and chief judge, who are not necessarily legal experts, are assisted by three such experts called sabhya or assessors. These three legal consultants are probably related to the three justices of the Arthashastra. Other court personnel include bailiff, an accountant, and a scribe. A lawsuit is called Artha. It begins with a plaintiff called Arthin filing a complaint with the court. The initial complaint called Bhasha is written on an erasable surface such as a chalkboard. The plaintiff is permitted to revise it until the defendant called Prati Arthi, files his plea, the Uttara, which is then written down along with the revised plaint on a more permanent surface, such as a palm leaf. Sources give clear guidelines as to the format of the plaint and the plea. Any serious deviation from those guidelines would render them legally invalid. The 5th century jurist Yanyavakya calls the plaint and plea the first two of the four feet of a court proceeding. Once the plaint and the plea have been filed with the court, the substantive part of the court proceedings begins. According to Yanyavakya, the third foot of the proceedings is the presentation of evidence. The task before that, however, is to determine which party has the burden of proof. 
This may seem obvious today. The plaintiff, we assume, has the burden of proof. However, the ancient Indian jurists saw the issue as more complex. The kind of plea entered by the defendant determines which party must produce evidence. If it is one of admission, called Sang Pratipatti, then the legal proceedings stop and the plaintiff wins the case. If it is one of denial, that is Mithya, then the burden falls on the plaintiff. Ancient law recognizes two other scenarios. The defendant can present a qualified admission, also called special plea. For example, if the plaint says the defendant took a loan of rupees 1000, the defendant may admit that he did indeed take the loan but claim that he paid it back. Alternatively, the defendant can claim that the same plaintiff filed an identical lawsuit previously and a court had found him innocent. In both these cases, the burden of proof shifts from the plaintiff to the defendant. He has to prove that he did indeed pay back the loan or that a prior court ruled in his favour. Once the burden of proof has been determined, the presentation of evidence begins. The most significant kind of evidence is live witnesses. This was especially so prior to about the 4th century of the Common Era, when writing became widespread and legal documents began to play an important role. Unless both parties agree, a minimum of three witnesses is required. There are detailed rules regarding the admissibility of witnesses for both the plaintiff and the defendant. These rules relate to a variety of factors, including social class, gender and age. Witnesses are admonished by the judge to say truthfully what they have seen or heard reminding them of the dire consequences both here and in the hereafter of bearing false witness. One text, the Yanyavalkya Dharma Shastra says, and I quote, Whatever good deed you have done over hundreds of lifetimes, all that will go to the man you defeat by your false testimony, unquote. False witness as also anyone who suborns perjury is sent into exile. The sources identify clues to detect false testimony. These include sweating, the face changing color, lips becoming parched, looking from side to side and the like. It is however for the judge to, and the assessors to determine who is speaking the truth even though the statements of most witnesses are accepted as probative. Post-Gupta sources place greater weight on documentary evidence called Lekhya. Here the judges are told to be attentive and detect forged documents. The sources assume that most legal transactions, especially loans, are accompanied by a legal document attested to by witnesses and they spell out and the format and legal requirements of a valid document. The third kind of evidence is possession called bukti. This is especially pertinent for litigation with respect to land and houses. It is a principle of jurisprudence that possession over a certain number of years, usually 10, without objection establishes a person's ownership over real property. The final form of evidence, which may seem quaint to us, is ordeals. Sources give detailed rules for ordeals with fire, water, balance and so on. In medieval times, entire books were written on this topic. The assumption is that gods 
who are wedded to truth will identify a person who tells a lie in court. The final phase of the proceeding, the fourth foot, is judicial deliberation called pratyakalita, followed by the verdict or nirnaya. The court usually issues a document or jayapatra recording the judgment and gives it to the party that wins the case. The loser is forced to indemnify the victor and, in addition, is assessed a fine. The losing party, however, can file an appeal to a higher court. Sources generally recognize five fora of courts for resolving disputes. Family, Kula, Guild, Shreni, Company, Gunner, the Royal Court, and the King himself. The legal procedure outlined above is that of Royal Courts. Individuals who lose cases at the family or guild level can always appeal to a Royal Court. The losing side in the Royal Court also can appeal to the King himself, whose judgment is final and not subject to appeal. In this brief essay, I have given parenthetically the Sanskrit legal terms to highlight the sophisticated technical vocabulary of ancient Indian jurisprudence. Its earliest appearance can be found in the documents from the centuries just prior to the common era. Around the 6th or 7th century, we get text exclusively devoted to legal procedure, such as those ascribed to Narada, Katyayana and Brihaspati. By the time of the Guptas, this vocabulary can be seen to have undergone remarkable growth. So, jurisprudence stands out as one of the major achievements of ancient Indian intellectual tradition. Thank you.